Hello, and welcome to our commentary on The Chosen. My name is Dr. Scott Heppelfinger, and I am joined by my colleague and good friend, Dr. Michael Barber, and we are very blessed to serve on the faculty of the Augustine Institute's Graduate School of Theology. We are thrilled to have you here, and we are very excited to offer these thoughts and comments on what has turned out to be a very, very popular series, The Chosen. So what is The Chosen? So The Chosen is a massive television production about the life of Christ. And what it does is it fills in the backstory for who Jesus is and, and who are the people around him and what was the historical context of his ministry. Might be helpful here to just sort of give an example. So let's go to the first clip. Uh, this is from the first episode, the opening scene. We're going to see Mary Magdalene as a little girl. Now I wanna give you a warning that the scene is sort of a dark scene in the sense that it's, it's not highly lit, it's at night. So just be ready for that. And uh, let's take a look at this clip now. Papa? Hey, hey. she's sleeping, little one. Come sleep. Sit down, sit down. Your head hurting you again. No. I know. You are thinking of the big new star. Hey, look, it's right there, you see? No. Why can't you sleep? I'm scared. Of what? I don't know. Hey, what do we do when we are scared? We say the words. Adonai's words. From the prophet? Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, right? Thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not. Come now. I want to hear you sing. I want to hear your pretty voice. Come. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine. That's right. Now, Scott, this scene made me smile, right? She comes out, she says she's afraid, and her father says, well, why are you afraid? Well, maybe because she hears you coughing. And so right. it, it, it emphasizes Mary Magdalene's great love for her father, and she doesn't like hearing him sick. He's sort of oblivious to this. He, he's fixated on this star, which is ostensibly a reference to the star of Bethlehem. And then he has her recite a passage that is apparently familiar to her, something that he has taught her well, and it's a passage from Isaiah 43. And of course, none of this is in the Bible. The right. Bible never tells us anything about Mary Magdalene's father or her favorite Bible verses or anything like that. That's right. So it's, it's such a lovely scene. There are all of these dimensions to it. You have him refer to, these are Adonai's words, right? And so you have family piety in this scene. Um, and so you just appreciate it, and then you take a step back and you're kind of like, well, wait a minute. This just isn't in the Bible at all. And that kind of raises the question, right, of what are we to make of scenes like this in filling out the story of Jesus Christ? And so this is part of the reason that we wanted to offer some commentary on this series, right? Right. And I think for a lot of people, there are questions about this. Do they know what they're doing in, in bringing out some of these Ideas, for example, we see the father refer to Adonai, as you mentioned, which is the word for Lord in Hebrew. So here we get a little bit of Hebrew here, uh, which is which is helpful. Um, but there are so many people watching this, and one of the primary reasons we wanted to do this was because there are a lot of Catholics who are watching this. Now we, of course, not we we hope that non-Catholics will like our commentary or find it interesting, but. Uh, there are so many Catholics who are watching this now, and they're wondering, is this in keeping with the Catholic faith? How are we to connect with this? The producer is uh, Dallas Jenkins, whose father, Jerry Jenkins, was instrumental in the Left Behind series, which focuses on a certain kind of Protestant hope for the end times that doesn't really mesh well with Catholic teaching. So people wonder, okay, is this safe to watch? What are we to do? Can we make sense out of this? So we wanted to offer some thoughts on this. And, and I think it, it can 
Yeah. You you initially were actually kind of skeptical of this, right, Michael, when you I, heard I about the series? I was. I, I, I'll be honest with you. My mother is a huge fan of the show and has encouraged me to watch it many times. And I just, I couldn't get through the first episode. Uh, as a Bible scholar, you you have a lot of thoughts on things. And so I was really skeptical. Then I posted on some social media on Facebook and Twitter. I said, okay, I, looks like the Augustine Institute will be doing a commentary series on Formed. I'll be a part of it. What would you like to hear us talk about? And oh my goodness, there was such strong negative reaction. And some of the things that were said, I thought were actually unfair. And so now I really see the need for a kind of balanced commentary on this series. Yeah. And I came at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I had heard about the show and we thought, well, let's, you know, take a look at it. Um, and as I was watching it, um, being a non-Bible scholar, I don't have any thoughts. No, I'm just <laughs> um, no, I had some thoughts, but I was appreciative of a lot of things. Um, and there were some things that I thought, hmm, that's interesting, or maybe not quite how I would view it. But what I was struck by was how much it sent me back to Scripture, mm -hmm. thinking, well, I would have portrayed that differently. Why would I do that? What impression, how have I formed my impression of St. Peter, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to be able to go back to Scripture and to reflect and meditate prayerfully on Scripture, this was one of the biggest fruits, actually, of my taking a look um, at the show. But at the same time, there are questions, right, about things that aren't in the Bible or you know, if there are things that are in the Bible, or maybe there are some things that are less clear or even lead in the wrong direction, um, is this something, why, why should we even have this unformed? And I think it's important to say that, you know, we have lots of things unformed, and it's meant to enrich and nourish and form our faith. Um, and so we wanted to put this up to help direct people to the mystery of Christ, help all of us head back to Scripture to reflect on it. And then we wanted to provide some commentary to just kind of you know, guide people through some of the beauty of it, um, but also, you know, address things that maybe we would have done differently or right. just provoke some questions. Yeah, and it seems like the producers are aware that the main goal of the series is not to sort of refashion your understanding of who Jesus is, but ultimately to bring you back to the scriptures. And I'd like to go to a slide here and show you the title card. At the beginning of the first episode, there's this little caveat here, and we read, the Chosen is based on the true stories of the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Some locations and timelines have been combined or condensed. Backstories and some characters or dialogue have been added. However, all biblical and historical context and any artistic imagination are designed to support the truth and intention of the Scriptures. Viewers are encouraged to read the Gospels. So when I, when I see that first paragraph, right, you, you almost think of the beginning of a movie where it's like inspired by the story of, so, and then you, right. you're kind of like, is this even going to be anything like the original story? That's right. Um, but, I, but it doesn't work in quite that way here. Right. And I think it's important for us to also recognize that when we're thinking about the Gospels and when we're thinking about ancient historiography, it's not as if ancient writers thought that they were giving you a kind of video recording representation of what happened in the past. And I'd like to cite an ancient Jewish work uh, that Catholics will be familiar with because this is in the Catholic Bible. If we can go to the next slide here, guys. Uh, this is from a book called Second Maccabees, and it's an ancient Jewish work that describes really the events that were at the center of Hanukkah, the original Hanukkah celebration, how this, this group of Maccabees uh, overtook Gentile invaders and reconsecrated a temple, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And at the beginning of this work, we read the following. All this, everything that's in 2 Maccabees, which has been set forth by Jason of Cyrene in five volumes. So here we read that 2 Maccabees is basically a distillation right. of five books of history. It says, we shall attempt to condense, that's pretty much the same idea we see the, yeah. the, the, the producers of The Chosen use, into a single book. And then it says, for us who've undertaken the toil of abbreviating, you know, it's a lot of work to summarize something. Actually, it takes more time to synthesize than it does to just say everything you can. It is no light matter, but calls for sweat and loss of sleep. We will gladly endure the uncomfortable toil, 
leaving the responsibility for exact details to the compiler. So the author of Second Maccabees is recognizing our, our work here isn't exactly as it was, right? These are not the exact details. We go on to read, it is the duty of the original historian to occupy the ground, discuss matters from every side, and to take trouble with details. But the one who recasts the narrative should be allowed to strive for brevity of expression and to forego exhaustive treatment. So here we see that ancient writers, ancient Jewish writers, when they wrote history, understood that they needed to use some artistic license, right? right? That's just part and parcel of literature. Right. And there's, a, I mean, this relates to how we think about biblical inspiration. And you and I have had a chance to talk about this where you have different portrayals, for example, in art of the gospel writers. And in some, it's almost like this mechanical, God is almost moving the mm -hmm. hand of St. Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, and in others, there's the angel whispering and St. Matthew is fully engaged and you see his attention and his efforts. And I think it's that second view mm -hmm. that we've just seen in, in, in Second Maccabees. Mm -hmm. And it's the second view that sort of has a richer, I think, theological foundation that says God created us with certain gifts and certain abilities, and the artist uses those to convey the truth, and not just the surface level truth, but the truth in its, in its fullness. And so that's what we see. That's harder to do. That's that sweat and that toil. That's right. Um, and there's some selection and all of it that goes into that. And we don't just see that in the Old Testament. No, certainly we see that in the New Testament. So let's go to the next slide. This is from the Gospel of John. At the end of the Gospel of John, we read, but there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Right. And I love even earlier, just before in John's Gospel, <clears throat> the inspired author gives the rationale for this approach. John's gospel is built up on these signs that Jesus performs. And so towards the end of it, after we've had the final sign of the resurrection, um, St. John writes, you know, many other signs were performed by Jesus, but these have been written so that you might believe and have life in his name. And so there's a selection process that's going on mm -hmm. here, and these are carefully picked out to offer us a portrayal of Jesus that's not just meant to be a kind of surface-level portrayal, because, of course, there are many people in the gospel who see sort of the surface level of Jesus in the flesh and don't come to believe. And so what John is doing is helping us with the gifts that he has to select, to compile, to present, so that we may believe and have life. That's right. And so we see this in the gospel. And, and that's a difference between a Catholic approach, and not, not all Protestant approaches are fundamentalist, but there are some that are fundamentalist approaches that really don't make any room for that human dimension of inspiration. There's divine authorship, but then human authorship. And this is the understanding of the Second Vatican Council and the great document Dei Verbum. If we go to the next slide— uh, we see what the Catholic Church teaches about the way the Gospels were written. We, we see in the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, Dei Verbum, the sacred authors wrote the four Gospels selecting some things from the many which had been handed on by word of mouth or in writing, reducing some of them to a synthesis— explaining some things in view of the situation of their churches and preserving the form of proclamation, but always in such fashion that they told us the honest truth about Jesus. This sounds so similar to what the chosen producers are saying that they're doing in the production of The Chosen. So when I put on social media, well, we're going to be talking about The Chosen, I saw a lot of Catholics say, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that isn't exactly like it is in the Gospels. And I said to myself, well, wait a minute, we got to recognize that the Gospel writers are also using a bit of artistic license. And we actually can see that when we look at the narratives of the Gospels. I'll just give you an example, the resurrection narratives, right? So let's go to the next slide, yep. Matthew 28. And the account of the resurrection of Jesus, Easter Sunday, uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus says to the women who come to the tomb, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And so then the next thing we know, the 11 disciples go to Galilee, right? That's up north, they go to Galilee, 
And it says, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. We don't know how they knew which mountain they were supposed to go to. And Jesus came and said to them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All of this is in the context of Easter Sunday. So we have the, the resurrection appearance, and then we go right to the Great Commission in Galilee. In Luke's gospel, let's go to the next slide, guys. If, you, if we look at Luke's gospel, we see something different. On Easter Sunday, we have the famous story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We read, now on that same day, notice, yep. it's the same day, two of them, same day as the resurrection, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Then we go on to read, he led them out as far as Bethany. So Jesus appears to the 12 uh, in, in Jerusalem. So he's at Emmaus. He's on the road to Emmaus. Then he's in Jerusalem. Then he leads them out of Jerusalem. And we read next, while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. We have the ascension. Now we read later in the book of Acts that there were a number of days there between the resurrection and the and the ascension. Here we see the gospel writers are condensing, they're bringing things together as a synthesis, they're telescoping events, right? And so we're seeing the gospels, the gospel writers have that kind of artistic license. Right. And, you know, just to kind of draw out a couple of points from this, mm -hmm. in looking at scripture's approach to this compilation, the synthesis, God's working with the gifts that he gives, um, we see this at work in scripture. And you know, we're not saying that that makes the chosen the gospel. What we're not. trying to say is there, there can be often a tendency, I think, that the kind of standard for truth um, in our minds is kind of like either the history textbook or the newspaper journalistic, you know, article about something. Um, but in the ancient world, mm -hmm. and I think within the literary world and, and the, the whole Christian worldview, there are a variety of genres and a lot of room for depicting the truth. And so to take that method and apply it to a work like The Chosen, um, you know, is a very enriching way of approaching it. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be any issues that come up, um, but it means it's a very legitimate way of, of thinking about these things. And in the world of art, you know, I think there's an analog where sometimes we think the truest representation of something is the photograph. And so if we see a film or a TV production of the Gospels, we almost want a kind of photographic uh, representation of what we have in the Gospels. All the major scenes just translated into picture. Um, right. But actually, there's a, a long tradition. If we go to the next slide, um, the, you know, take a great painting like Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew. And there's so much in this painting that is... That is not in the Bible. I mean, I can't, well, I can't take a look at this. This is completely unrealistic. Look at these guys wearing medieval garb. I mean... I know. Well, if you avert <laughs> your gaze, I'll talk about it just a little bit. <laughs> um, so we have exactly right. The clothing in this image um, is not at all true to what we would have found at the time of the Gospels, Right. Um, and so we might have this approach that says, well, that actually kind of falsifies the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. But there's this interesting thing about the gospel, about the mysteries presented there, that every form of art will obscure something and reveal something. So let's imagine that Caravaggio had painted this in like first century, you know, Jewish mm -hmm. clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and we could say, well, that is true to what they were wearing. Mm -hmm. But then we might say, well, Something that might be missed there is that when Jesus comes into this room and we see that it's dark and dingy, it's sort of a symbolism of sin and the darkness, he comes in to call St. Matthew, um, and that calling and that response that we begin to see of St. Matthew towards discipleship, this is a call that applies at all times. Mm -hmm. It's a contemporary, contemporaneous reality that applies to you, to me, to you know when Caravaggio painted this. And so by updating the clothing, yes, it obscures the truth about the clothing they were wearing, but it reveals the truth about the urgency and the timeliness and relevance of Christ's call to each of us, mm -hmm. a call to discipleship. So we always have this balance with art. And by doing things in this way, we're able to bring out other truths as well. So for example, in this image, we see Christ's 
hand reaching out in a particular shape, which is fascinating. And if you notice St. Peter, who's next to Christ, St. Peter's hand is closely imitating the shape of Christ's hand, Mm -hmm. but it's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. He's on the way in discipleship. St. Matthew's hand is positioned in very similar way, but not this, not as similar as St. Peter's, and Jesus is the model. So we have mm-hmm. St. Matthew, who's not quite as far along, but he's responding, beginning to mm-hmm. respond, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a detail with the hand that brings out something remarkable about the stages of discipleship. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's even more there. Yeah, I, by the way, just to make a point before we move to the next slide, there is a kind of academic debate among art historians about which of those two figures is actually Matthew, that's right. right? So even when we put something into artistic form, there's going to be some ambiguity here. Is it the man who's pointing to himself, or is it the younger man who's so focused on his money that he doesn't recognize Jesus when he first comes in the room? Right, and one of the richnesses to that view, I think it's the wrong view, by the way, but yeah, that's fine. is that then you have another stage of discipleship, someone who hasn't even looked up to see the light. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the reason I think St. Matthew is the one holding up the hand is if you look closely at the picture— most of the legs in the picture are in a kind of relaxed position, mm-hmm. but St. Matthew's legs are flexed. He's mm-hmm. beginning to stand mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. So this is a kind of modern theory about mm-hmm. which one is really St. Sure. Matthew. Right. And I like the traditional view. But, you know, there's so much in there, right? And, and I like the way the light is being used here as yes. it falls on his face, right? He's seeing the light, literally. And we've seen that in in The Chosen, there is a kind of play with darkness. Right. We mentioned how and the scenes it, are at night and some somewhat dark. Yeah. Yeah. And if we look at that light, I mean, we say, did it actually happen that way? Right. Well, given that the light's not even coming from the window, right? Right. We'd probably say, no, it probably didn't. But right. it's symbolizing something with this chiaroscuro, this light and That's this right. dark in the image. All right. So let's talk about this scene now. We saw the hand of yeah. Jesus reaching out. And many art historians see here an allusion to this painting by Michelangelo of the creation of Adam. Right. Jesus' hand is in a kind of, if you re- reverse the image horizontally, <clears throat> Jesus' hand matches almost perfectly the hand of Adam yep. in this picture. And so Jesus is being presented as the new Adam. And we're going to see new creation themes also drawn out in The Chosen. But Michael, did Jesus know Michelangelo's painting in order to put, <laughs> right? So this is the point that right. what is being shown in that is a theological truth about recreation right. that is present in the gospel, but the artist is challenged how to depict that right. Right, in a different medium. Right, exactly. And we're going to see that kind of artistic use in The Chosen. And as a Bible scholar, there are some things I'm going to say wait a minute, that isn't exactly right. Or as a Catholic, we might look at that and say, this is really ignoring an ancient tradition that might have been presented differently if, a, if it was coming from a fully Catholic imagination. But um, let's go to one more scene here. Uh, clip number two, guys. I'd like to look at this scene. This is a scene where Nicodemus is talking to the Roman praetor Quintus. Let's take a look at this scene and we'll talk about it. On the other side of it. My name is Quintus. I'm the Praetor of Caperna. And I am... You are the great Nicodemus. Word travels fast. Are you arresting me? (laughs) Oh, my friend. I'm a magistrate, not a military man. I serve the will of the people and Pilate. And I serve only God. Yes. Yes. So do your enemies, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots rogue preachers in the wilderness raving about a coming messiah. They're all vying for the people's affection. What do you want, Quintus? I believe taxes are going unpaid. If you help me, I will help the Pharisees continue to thrive. How can I? The people already drowning in tax. Tell me, Nicodemus, what can be under the water and yet never drown? Fish? I love on the ending of that, fish? (laughs) Right. (laughs) I really love the character of Nicodemus, actually. But, you know, we're talking about filling in the artistic imagination, right? Backstory. Here's another scene. And like our first scene, it's not a scriptural scene, right? In the sense, there's no passage we can refer to about this scene. Right. But it is helpful because it helps us understand the complexities that uh, were involved in 
the backdrop of the gospels, of the gospel stories. So Nicodemus's first question is, are you arresting me? Right? <laughs> yeah. Which is appropriate because the Romans were completely arbitrary. And we want to make sure we remember that even though we see little kids dressed up in centurion sometimes or as Roman soldiers, they weren't cute and cuddly. The Romans were absolutely terrorizing. They were brutalizing the people in the land. That was the appropriate question Nicodemus would have asked. And then we see Nicodemus say, well, he's serving God. And Quintus kind of dismisses that and say, well, that's what you all say, even your enemies. And then he identifies as enemies of the Pharisees, groups like the Essenes, who seem to have described the Pharisees as the seeker of smooth things, people who want to find loopholes in the law, things like that, uh, or the uh, the zealots or uh, Sadducees. Sadducees, yeah, that's yeah. that's one that's mentioned, not the zealots. The Sadducees, which was another Jewish group. We'll talk about them later on. And then he also talks about people who are preachers in the wilderness, probably right. a reference to John the Baptist, but there were other figures too, like John the Baptist, who were sort of charismatic figures at the time. Uh, and then he says that he wants to help the Pharisees continue to thrive. And we do know that the Pharisees held a sort of political sway with the masses in Jesus's day. All of this helps us remember that the Gospels have to be understood in their historical context. This is a very important aspect of Catholic teaching about studying the Gospels. We have a kind of incarnational understanding of the inspired Word, right? The inspired, uh, the incarnate Word, Jesus in flesh, is fully God, fully man. Well, likewise, in the scriptures, we have divine authorship, we have human authorship. Those human authors are writing in a particular time, and the events that they're writing about are sort of couched within the realities of their time. And so the chosen is going to help us better understand in a lot of ways those circumstances, but there are going to be points as well where I'm going to you know, maybe say, wait a minute, this I think is a little unfair. This isn't exactly accurate. One thing I do like about this is it shows the pluriform nature of Judaism in the first century, uh, that there were all kinds of different ways to be Jewish. There were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees. So people will say things like, what did the Jews believe? Well, which Jews are you talking right. about? And, and as you said, that this is um, intended to be enriching to not only our understanding, but also our, our kind of Lexio Divina, our meditation on Scripture, yes. where you know our hope is that we go back to the Gospel passages. We start noticing, oh, here it mentions the Sadducees, right? The scribes are here. Um, a zealot? You know, and there are these different groups. It is pluriform, as you said. And kind of bubbling within this surface is this messianic expectation, right, that even the, the Romans are aware of this, are keenly aware of this, because it certainly impinges upon them, right? And so when we go to the Gospels, um, we want to have this enriching historical context mm -hmm. in mind um, so that we can appreciate the characters and, and imagine the scenes with greater depth to be mm -hmm. drawn into them. I mean, it's, it's really beautiful when we look at um, the way that Christian tradition has thought about prayer and spirituality. Um, just to take one example, St. Francis de Sales, when he talks about, well, how do you, how do you meditate right, on, on Scripture? Um, and he points out that we use our imaginations when we pray. Prayer engages the whole of the human person so that we imagine a scene, for example. We reason about that scene. And in doing that, and in great detail and with some effort, St. Francis de Sales makes the remarkable point that we can increase within ourselves contrition, for example, or uh, our love for God can be enkindled. And what is remarkable and very freeing about this is it means we're not just subject to our own whims, right? Where it's like, well, I don't feel contrite today, so I guess I'm not sorry. No, if we meditate on Christ's suffering and death, then we can in, instill or grow contrition within us. So this is kind of the hope going forward for our commentary. You know, it's not meant to be comprehensive. It's not meant to be a retelling of the story. It's not meant to be a commercial for the chosen. What it is meant to be is just continuing this type of analysis looking at historical factors, artistic factors, theological dimensions, so that we can try to highlight how it can be fruitful in our lives. That's right. St. Teresa of Avila says that all the evil in the world is the result of not knowing sacred scripture, right? Or as St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So we hope that people will be watching The Chosen in order to go back to sacred scripture. 
and to focus their attention on sacred scripture, which is really in keeping with what the producers of The Chosen have told us is their own intention. So we look forward to talking to you on future episodes. We're going to be doing a commentary on every single episode in the first season as on the Christmas special as well. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Until then, may God bless you and your family.